This week, we discuss threat intelligence and how to make the most of it in the stories of the week. We'll tell you how to become a pen tester and how to turn your clunker into a smart car. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and systems aren't the only things getting penetrated, functions are the only things getting wrapped, bits aren't the only things getting banged, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pone Pad, the Pone Phone, and the Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. The SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit sans.org to explore the full curriculum and latest training offerings. And now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself an adult beverage, and give the intern control of your botnet. It's Security Weekly, and I'm your host, Paul Story, and welcome everyone to this show with my fabulous host on the lines via Skype, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. Welcome, Mike. Sir, always good to see you. Yes, good to see you as well. Thank you for joining me this evening, Mike. Hopefully, Carl's Perez will join us uh, in a little bit. So I am flying solo here in studio. I have Mike on the screen behind me, which is it's very, well, it's eerie and comforting all at the same time. <laughs> you try being me, looking at me, looking at you. you. Well, and you're behind me. I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of scared. And Thank in you. front of you, because yes. you're in front of me. <laughs> well, this is episode 439. It is October 22nd for 2015. I've got one quick announcement. Look for a big discount on our Hack Naked shirts coming to the store. We're going to run another big fire sale because we get a lot of shirts and they're not doing any good sitting in the room next door in crates. We want you to wear them. We want to sell them to you at a fabulous price. We also have limited edition Security Weekly 10-year anniversary hoodies. I got to send you one, Mike. Mike, you just send me your, your mailing address. Here's the hoodie right here. Right on. So it's got the Security Weekly logo in the back. It says 10 years on the front, and it also has the Hack Naked logo on it. Uh, these are really super nice hoodies. They will be on sale in the store uh, for your enjoyment. So uh, that's a new item that we've added. It's very special and limited. So uh, look for a file, fire sale. You can join our mailing list to find out about all of the discount codes at securityweekly.com forward slash insider. Uh, Mike, I'm very excited to talk about the topic that I've chose for this evening. You seem I'm pretty fired up too. about it as well. <laughs> you how, instantly had... Threat intelligence. Like, how can you not be excited? I have opinions about this. I thought it would be... No, no, I have questions. I wish you I had... You do have... Been. I've been asking a lot of questions about this topic, and I finally decided to make it a, a topic for the show. Since we didn't have an interview scheduled for this show, I thought it was a very opportune time to, uh, to talk about a topic, which is nice. It gives us some time where we can really dig deep into a topic rather than just kind of gloss it over uh, in our stories of the week. Um, we're also, you know, we're, we're pretty tired from our 10-year anniversary show. Those videos are up on YouTube. The audio is coming soon. Make sure you go check that out. There's a YouTube playlist with all of the videos from the 10-year. Um, it got interesting in a lot of different ways. Interviews with Miko Hipponen. We did panel discussions on mobile security and privacy, bug bounties. Uh, it was a fabulous day. We drank lots of cocktails. Thank you to Apollo celebrated and concluded the day by dumping beer into a bunch of laptops. 
um, which dis- was after you've been drinking all day is not something you want to do in a brand new studio. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> we also played Hacker Jeopardy, which was awesome. And I don't, I don't know how. Well, I got through the whole 44 minutes of Hacker Jeopardy that we played here on the show, and not once did I utter the words, your mother's a whore, Trebek. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> next time, next time. You got, you got, hey, you got to have goals. Whore ads for 100, please. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you've seen those. They're hilarious. <laughs> After having played Jeopardy, they're even more hilarious to me now. Okay. So... Threat intelligence. Mike, you had questions. Did you want to? Your questions helped frame some of my talking points that I had. So, why don't we? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, The first question is going to seem familiar to everybody. And it's it's the one they hear me ask all the time. But let me get both out and then you can hit them both at the same time. What's the problem we're trying to solve? I hear a lot of people talk about threat intelligence. I take a lot of briefings, uh, people who want me to write about it because it's, it's the solution to everything. And when I say, what's the problem we're trying to solve? I'm looking for somebody to give me a cogent answer that doesn't have a lot of hyper jargon in it. The second question, and this is actually becoming more important to me now, how tall do I have to be to ride this ride? What I mean by that is what level of maturity, sophistication, what do you have to have in place? What do you have to know? And and I get people that start up, well, anybody can benefit from it. No. It's uh, no, I mean, maybe, but, but then what do you have to have and what's the benefit you're going to get from it? So what do you think, Paul? Uh, Let's start. What's the problem? Somebody says threat intelligence. What do they mean? So if, by you mean by like, if when we're talking about threat intelligence, people say, well, I really want to use it because I want to solve a problem. The problem that most people are trying to solve with threat intelligence is finding the bad things that are wrong in their network. And when we put it in the context of threat intelligence, it's, Usually someone else knows about something, either one potentially bad that's going on in my network or something a little more concrete that is definitely going on in my network. Because the bad thing that happened in my network left a footprint somewhere else that told someone else about it. So by using threat intelligence, I can find out about the bad things that are happening in my network. Does that help? I think, actually, I think it's a really good start. But let me, and I'm not trying to throw water on the the fire here, but... Correct me if I'm wrong. What are we seeing most of the challenges are in all of these threat reports that come out, all the breach reports that come out? Well, it's, it's not malicious outsiders executing some fantastic attack, right? It's mostly insiders' mistakes, misconfigurations, phishing. Yeah, and it, it's certainly when people uh, – I, what I try and tell people is don't – it's not the end-all, be-all, right? I, 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 the moral of the story here, Mike, with threat intelligence that I tell everyone – that a lot of people are too focused on threat intelligence and they're too focused on just getting a feed from someone and, oh, they're going to tell me about the bad things in my network. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You got it backwards, right? Focus on your network, what you know, and finding indicators of compromise and doing security well. Then supplement that with... Yeah, it's an augmentation. Exactly. Yeah. And I I tell people, and it's eye-opening for some, uh, some people dismiss it, which is interesting, uh, I tell them you need to take threat intelligence, integrate it into vulnerability management, integrate it into user awareness, integrate it into your SIM, integrate it into your malware detection, and have it play a role in all of the things that you're already doing well, which speaks to your second question, Mike, how tall do I need to be to ride Can I ride? add to your <laughs> list before you answer the question? What's that? I've started working out a program for a security intelligence briefing, and mm-hmm. I think that's where threat intelligence has a fantastic opportunity. Imagine the ability to, to, to do a, a consistent security intelligence briefing in your organization where you're not, you're not kingdom building, you're not grandstanding, you're not asking for budget. You're going to give them a, a, a brief, tight, tactical look at what's going on in your network, in your environment, in your industry, tight and fast. Because who doesn't want to be party to that? It's an intelligence briefing. Done right? That's how you start getting people to pay attention. So. One more, one more idea for the list. Yeah, and so to speak to your question as to how tall do I need to be to ride the ride, you need to have vulnerability management, patch management, some level of malware threat detection internally, um, have some type of log management and analysis program that's ongoing. Um, even better, the ones that are really in great shape are the ones that have a gold standard for configuration of all their systems in the environment. You know, people that come to me that have that and they ask me about threat intelligence, I'm like, 
dude, you're already winning. <laughs> like, you know, and use your threat intelligence. And if it says something about, well, hey, you know, attackers are coming after systems in this way, go tune your gold standard to make sure your systems are configured to prevent that. And there's a lot of attacks and threat vectors that operate really uh, solely not based on missing patches, but maybe a misconfiguration on your systems, and you can't ignore that. So I think it, it hits a lot of different aspects of security. Is that model out there? Is that anything you've published or anything you've seen somebody else publish? Oh, like I mean, what we, the gold standard should be? Well, not just for, I mean, I, I more of like the, you know, how tall you need to be to ride the ride. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I'm saying that is because what I've come to realize is that in our industry, we, we use the term maturity model a lot. And yeah. uh, sometimes it doesn't mean what the people thinks it means. Mm -hmm. And then we use these other words a lot. And so we, we start to get ourselves confused. So I'm not going to worry about maturity or anything else, but there should be some sort of an entry criteria. And I think the list you gave was solid. Well, I I'm also, also running through the list, list of like, things I've done in the last 20 years and going, yeah, that's that's a fairly mature organization. Yeah, if you want to look at like the shortest you can be to ride the ride, <laughs> yeah. you, you have to have an incident response program, right? If you have that, in, in, it's a pretty good incident response program, I and mean, we have to define what that is. But you know, if you've got a well-defined process in place that can take in information get it to the right people so that you can remediate a problem or respond to an incident, clean it up and keep the business running. If you have that plan in place, you can take advantage of threat intelligence information in some capacity. Um, okay. It's not as like useful to you standard. if you have all those other, you know, if you have all those other things, it's going to be far more valuable. But having a good incident response program, I think, is very key to your first steps into assimilating information from others. Let me amplify that thing you said, too. We talked about more valuable that's the thing, right? I mean, when you look at value creation, value capture, the, the more things you have in place on that list that, that you gave and maybe that we'll be able to develop, the more likely you are to create and capture more value, which makes it easier to position it, sell it, operate it, and ultimately get benefit from it. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about user awareness because I, I did recently <laughs> put that in my list, Mike. As it's fire up, Michael Knight. Yeah. Well, I have. Here's why I have it in in my list, and I, uh, you know, we can do a. We could spend a whole hour just defining what user awareness is, right? And we we have. I can we, do it for you quick. Yeah. It, it, well, what good user awareness is, and how to structure a program. I do talk about some of those things. Um, you know, when I, I I brief certain people and talk to certain people. But I've identified user awareness, I think, more recently as um, a receiver of some of that filtered down threat intelligence. Put this in the context of a pharmaceutical company or a financial company. If you're receiving threat intelligence that's specific to your industry, I think funneling some of that into your user awareness program is a, a great approach because now the user has some of that intelligence. And if the user can be aware and know what to do when they see something and communicate that to the right people, which is some integral components to user awareness program, I think they can be a receiver of some threat intelligence to say, hey, this latest attack that's coming against financial organizations, you know, to use a stupid example, people are dropping USB thumb drives in the parking lot. Make your users aware of that. Um, you know, they're infecting this type of site with this type of malware, and here's what to look for. Giving them a little more intelligence so that they can make better use of the awareness training that they're getting, I think is valuable. But again, Mike, you know, to speak to how tall you need to be, you have to have a pretty mature user awareness program to be able to take advantage of that. Yeah, let me let me start by completely agreeing with you. So, uh, yep, everything you've said, I completely agree with. Here, here's where I just want to draw a little bit of a finer point, though, as we talk about it. I hear people say the words "user awareness," "user awareness training" uh, together. That's like saying meditation, meditation training. The, the, when you don't separate the two out, you you're conflating concepts. There's a progression. So when we talk about wanting to change behaviors, there's a three-point progression. It's awareness, training, and then development. Awareness is the realization. Mm -hmm. Training is the new skills. Development is using those skills in the context. When we set the bar at training and development, we are setting ourselves up for failure. A user awareness program, in fact, I hate saying user, a, a, a solid awareness program need only do couple basic things. And the most basic of them is it needs to interface with your incident response program. 
if somebody writes, and I, I'm actually tired of the see something, say somethings, they work where they work only because of the cultural norms that we've established around them. For, for decades and decades, we've pointed out things that we don't like. So now we say, if you see one of these things we've already culturally sensitized you to, you should tell somebody. And we go, see, it works for them. It works for us. Yes. But it, look, if you have a successful awareness program, what it means is that if somebody is uncomfortable, whether it's on their computer or in the environment, on their mobile device, they are comfortable reporting it. And they know who to report it to. Right. So then what happens with that is you're going to get a lot of false positives. As that continues, then you can use that the, what, what you're collecting in the examples and showcase what you want to see and showcase what you don't want to see. Mm -hmm. That done right does lead to where some people will seek out training and you can offer training. And then you can work on developing and actually shaping the behaviors. And there, there's a – we don't have enough time f to yeah. really get into that stuff. So let's go back to it. I love the idea of using intelligence. I think it's fantastic. Go, in fact, you know, it's very akin to if you want to go give it a briefing to the executives and uh, the officers and the and the directors on a regular basis on uh, security, you could do the same thing for the people that you work with. The only thing is, we just need to remember we need to translate it. It has to it has to get translated into something. There needs to be a story. We need to show the examples of it. You know, telling somebody don't pick up a USB, bad things will happen, and actually showing them an example of it. Two very different things. And the first one is easy and has absolutely no value. And the second one is harder and it has a lot of value. Right. Um, so that, those are all great points, Mike. I don't, um, I don't just necessarily disagree with any of them. Um, uh, you know, also what I, I tell people, well, what you reminded me of uh, in the, the physical aspect of it is that when I've done penetration tests and I talk to penetration testers, we all pretty much agree that like the hardest people to do a physical pen test against are people who have been through a physical pen test, right? And yep. the, the even to set the bar higher, the more difficult organizations to get on a second physical pen test are ones that have an effective awareness program because they've taken that data from the first pen test and they've put it across all of their users. <laughs> and now when you go in the second thing, like the, the people know what to look for and they know right. how to well, record and, it. So, and, and what, what we discount almost instantly with that is that they told those stories mm -hmm. because somebody watched it. So instead of going, yeah, like they said, no piggyback. They're like, yeah, do you remember that guy? Do you remember what he was wearing? Yeah. yeah. He dressed up like a water delivery guy, yes. but he didn't look right. Right. He wasn't a normal guy. Yeah. Well, you know, Joe let him in. Right. And, and that's, mm -hmm. so even if they amplify the story and they sanitize it, Everybody else is going, yeah, that was Joe. I don't right. want to be like Joe. And it sucks to be Joe, but everybody else. So, yeah, because they've had some sort of an experience with it. So that's the other thing, too, you know, just while we're on this for a second. What I like about using threat intelligence to shape your awareness is if you can make it more germane to your company or to your industry, that's great. Because when I see people try to tackle on, well, we're going to cover 144 slides. No, you won't. Mm -hmm. We're going to cover 12 topics this year. No, you won't. This is why we keep going over the same stuff over and over. See, awareness doesn't denote understanding. All it, all it says is there's a connection between an action and an impact, period. That's it. And if, if that connection rises to a certain level, there's some action that I should take. That's, that's it. Mm -hmm. So if we try to do too much or it's, it's not relevant or timely – people will naturally tune it out. And frankly, they should. If you're going to start to use the threat intelligence and say, hey, based on what's important to us as an organization and what's happening to organizations just like ours, hey, here's three things I want you to look at. Let me tell you a story about it. Let me show you how you might identify it. And by the way, remember, if you see that, here's the number to call, the email to send, the place to text, however right. you let that's people that's work. Yeah. Oh, man, you've nailed it. You, you'll be ahead of 90% of everybody else. Yep. Mike, you want to bring it back to threat intelligence. Um, what if you're an organization that's somewhat overwhelmed by the amount of threat intelligence that you're taking in from external sources? What advice do you have for those organizations? I think that's a great question. I mean, this is where we start looking at capabilities and what's valuable. And, you know, I, I, if I'm because I get to cheat, I'm looking at your outline as we're talking mm -hmm. about it. You know, it's, I, I think you've nailed it really well. You, you have to have some level of self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. If you find that, in fact, let's, let me look at it slightly negative, even though I don't like to be negative. If you're overwhelmed, there's too much data coming in, then there's a very natural thing that happens. You turn it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you don't know what to do with it. With it. Yeah. 
And, and, and so, I, think, uh, I think it's a sign that you're also somewhat reliant on the external information. And when I, I like to almost like turn the tables a little bit and say, well, you should probably focus more time, uh, you know, don't take in as much threat intelligence and focus more time looking internally. And then, of course, the next logical question is, well, what do I look for? Like the uh, the reason that I'm looking externally is because I'm overwhelmed when I look internally and I don't know what to look for. So I'm taking these external feeds to know what to look for. So 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 I, you're what you're very politely saying is it's a cop out. Yeah, I'm trying to be polite and political. No, dude, I, I loved it. Yeah, I I just I kind of feel like I want to be a little more but, blunt about it. Yeah, but you have to back that up, right? You can't just go in and say that, right? You've got to. I, I feel like we have to back that up. So the one thing I use to back it up. Um, I draw on my experiences from this show in an interview that we did with Michael Goff several episodes ago, but I think before you were coming on the show regularly, Mike, and um, Michael's project is still active, and he's got what he calls the Windows Logging Cheat Sheets. And I don't know why this doesn't get more attention, but in all the interviews that I've done where I've talked about, I mean, we've done a lot of interviews, and we've talked a lot about how you find the bad things in your network. This is one of the things that comes to mind. He has uh, two cheat sheets, and he just updated them in September. Um, his website is malwarearchaeology.com. And the first <laughs> cheat sheet he has is here's all the things you need to do on Windows systems to enable all the proper logging so that mm. the systems are telling you everything that's going on. The second guide that he gives you is how to configure, I believe it's Splunk he uses as an example in his guide. But you could apply that to any product or technique that you're using in your organization. How to configure your Splunk, for example, to detect the bad things that just came about as a result of all that extra logging. So how to filter through and find the bad things. And That's what awesome. this is telling you is, you know, this file changed and this registry entry changed and, you know, a connection was made on this port. If you see those three events that you're not logging, a really bad thing happened. Like light bulbs go off from, you know, people's heads. You're like, wow, that's really, that's really good. And, you know, Michael's uh, research and his ongoing project is further validated. We interviewed someone from Microsoft, and I apologize. I should have pulled the exact episodes uh, and interviews that we did. Um, but we interviewed someone from Microsoft who uh, is responsible for the security of Microsoft. And I asked him, you know, what do you do to secure Microsoft? And he very closely mirrored what Michael was talking about. Basically, we enable this extra logging, and we have tools that are able to pull out what we think is bad behavior, and we're far more accurate than any antivirus system or any product uh, that we've tried to implement on the market. So that's awesome. Yeah, to have that extra validation is is great. So um, I wanted to share that advice with listeners. I do have some particular products in mind, right? Um, I think that. Uh, there's a lot of great products on the market. There's a lot of not so great products on the market, of course. Um, but I like to also look at user behavior. I think user behavior is a good component. You don't want to just look at system data, system data, network data, NetFlow data. That stuff is great too. But I feel like we're a little too focused on that. We want to look a little more at user behavior. You know, where, where are users connecting to? Usually it's the user, right, that is making that connection, downloading that malware, they're taking some action. If we can analyze user behavior <clears throat> a little better, I think we can do a much better job of finding the bad things in our network. Yeah, or it's their account that's been compromised. I mean, it, we, yeah, there's a it, lot. Insider threats heating back up again, but yeah. I looked at the definition from 1995, and it says it's somebody who's an insider who's trusted who went malicious. Mm -hmm. Yep, 1995, totally agree. 2015? Nope, we gotta we gotta twist that just a little bit and say, well, what if their account was compromised? But let me let me tell you my favorite uh, solution for this Expo Marker, uh, and you go to the whiteboard mm -hmm. and you sit down with people that are responsible for your top systems and you ask them how they work. Yeah, because the, the thing I find in well, that's on my list too. Is know know what your critical systems no, are, it's, it's, where your it's data lies, there. which is hard. Which is hard. That's hard to do. I was just going to point out what yeah. what I've suggested is. But it, your whiteboard session is a great shortcut, Mike. I like it. Well, it, sometimes it's a shortcut. Sometimes it's a little it's a little eye opening for everybody involved because you know. And and so the way to approach it's got to be really careful. You can, you can't come in and demand. Tell me how it all works, and we're going to the whiteboard. It's more of a hey, I want to make sure I'm protecting the stuff that matters most to you. Can you give me, talk me through how things work so I can get a sense of mm -hmm. where I might want to look for things, where I might, where intelligence that I can gain externally might be valuable internally. And uh, and then don't be surprised when somebody says, uh, I don't know. Say, cool, well, 
if you can't, why don't we go to the whiteboard and start drawing it up? And nine times out of 10, when you do that, the first time we're through, uh, it's a little messy and it's not always accurate. But, but if you stick with it, it's not only more accurate, you start to understand really where there are some weaknesses. Maybe you can work to correct them, but at least you know where to look. And by the way, they start to get a sense of what you're doing too. It's a great time too to have those questions, again, around threat intelligence say, hey, what are some of the things that you would look for? Mm. Now that you know the system so well, what would you do here? And then what do you think I should look for in place of that? And, and when we start involving other people in it, there's a lot of things that we can do that I, I think really start to make that difference. And so when you talk about the systems that are critical, those that hold critical data, I love the idea of automating stuff. But sometimes the best solution, especially when you're talking about the things that are really important to the company, uh, are going and asking those questions. By the way, when I go ask CISOs this question or CIOs this question, I say, hey, what are the top five initiatives of the organization? What are the top five ways that you make money? What are the top five systems that I need to know about that support those things? I, I get a lot of blank looks and a lot of, well, Michael, which is, you know, code for I'm going to try to bullshit you, but hopefully you, you buy whatever I'm going to tell you. Mm-hmm. I'm not suggesting these are easy answers, but, but what I love is if you use that combination, if you can go find some scripts or some tools that let you start to figure it out, and then you can map that to good old-fashioned human intelligence, mm-hmm. go talk with people and build those relationships, you'll know what to look for. And I think that's actually pretty impressive. <clears throat> you know, it's, it remind me of a, a story. I, I've told this on the podcast before, probably several years ago, but it was when I was working for a university, and I started to have, like, I had gotten mature enough as a security professional to start to have those conversations with people. I can remember some of the first uh, first few times it happened, I got kind of like a weird reaction. I kind of got a, like, uh, we sat down with, uh, use an example, you know, a team that was implementing um, an HVAC system that was needed to be connected to the network. Um, you know, it, we, it was a SCADA system for all intents and purposes, right? It controlled lights, heat, temperature, that kind of thing. And I started asking them uh, at the very beginning of the meeting, I'm like, okay, so tell me how it works. Tell me how people use it. And they're like, well, yeah, but you're the security guy. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that we're going to have a firewall on the system and, you know, we're going to put patches on it in this interval. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to show me how it works, how people use it, and then I'll come up with some more recommendations for you on how we can secure it. And to get people to change their mindset from, like, security is just like this thing that comes along and then goes away to, oh, like, security is a process that feeds into the whole thing, and security has to understand how it works, how people use it, so they can help us. Um, and it, it was a really big kind of turning point in, in my career when I realized that. So offering as advice to our listeners, I think, is important. Yeah. In, in fact, um, I, I threw a story into the mix for tonight, so we'll talk about it later. But it, it lays on precisely that thing. It's, it's, there's a process to it. And, and that's where that relationship comes in. So that's an awesome story. And, and that's, that's a good way to take a look at it. All right. So let's say now you've started to figure out your critical systems and critical data. What are some things you look about? Because if, if I look at your list, you, you list out malware and understanding what it's doing against your environment. So it would seem to me then, Paul, that it's important to understand what's in your environment. Yeah, um, and I, I tie a lot of this to vulnerability management, Mike, right? Because that's the space I've played in for some time. So you're new to it, but there's hope. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, I, I hope I get into conversations that I am forced to ask questions or, or don't understand and people teach me things, right? Um, uh, you always have to be learning. Uh, in fact, there's an article that I have that's a great quote from H.D. Moore along those lines. We'll get to that in our next segment. But what uh, I find that people have a tough time with, and it, it comes down to, to, it relates to threat intelligence, right? Because I recommend people take threat intelligence and feed that into the vulnerability management system. And they're like, well, what, that, what does that mean? And I tell them, look, everyone has this problem. We've got too many systems that present too many vulnerabilities, and we can't fix them all all at once. So right. how do you prioritize? It's like that age-old problem, right? So what I tell them, like, there's a couple of indicator or a couple of uh, techniques that I recommend to people to get them started. Uh, and I don't pretend to have all the answers, believe me, um, because I still think once we get to the, the end of my list, we're gonna, there's an issue that I don't think we've quite solved yet. But I say, look, most modern vulnerability management systems and, and techniques that you'll use in your environment, you can pretty easily figure out what exploits malware is going after and fix those first. I mean, that's 
that's like the really bad stuff, right? Like there is someone that has written a program to automatically go infect your systems using specific vulnerabilities. Go fix those, right? I mean, that's a no-brainer. Uh, the second is there's a, a much larger pool, I think. So that's a pretty small pool. You should be able to deal with that pretty easily. There's a much larger pool. And again, this could come from some form of threat intelligence as well. But there are lots more vulnerabilities that we know there's an exploit for. We don't necessarily know or have intelligence that people are using it today, but we know that it is possible that someone could have an exploit for a much larger number of vulnerabilities. Go fix those. Um, and again, this ties into your organization and where your data lies and all that stuff, but looking at it from a higher level, right? Go fix the ones that have exploits for them. But then you get down to, you still need to go fix everything else. And I say, you know, pen testing and some other products on the market can help you identify paths, you know, in and out of your network that could be used by attackers, which helps prioritize the rest of them. So <clears throat> if you do that, they, you know, that'll take care of a bunch in, in certain points in time, especially. Um, but then le we were talking uh, with, with Ron Gula on the 10-year show, right? We've got this, the largest pool of vulnerabilities that even are the ones that are left after you do all of that. Let's say you can do all the things I talked about and identify all those vulnerabilities and fix them really fast. You've got What this, color unicorn does that come with? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you've got this other gigantic pool of vulnerabilities that are all... They could be informational, they could be low severity, they could be a service that's running that you're not using. There's all these other things that there's no proof of an eminent threat, but there are some risk in how do you prioritize and, and fix all that. And oh, by the way, this gigantic pool probably changes quite a bit, right? It's the largest pool, it's going to have the most change. People can spin up a new system, they can put new software, they can bring their own devices in. There's lots of things that can happen in this pool of things all right that so you've, you don't you've have spun up for you've spun up three questions let me mm -hmm. see if i can remember all three the first of the questions is how much of that is reasonable uh for the typical firm organization to get through and we'll, we'll come back to it second one then is does is this where we start to look for machine learning and other ways of improving how we parse this information and and how we prioritize and act on it uh, and then I, the third one I forgot, so it'll come back to me in a minute. So I, what I tend to think about along this context of <clears throat> dealing with this issue is never getting behind, right? Trying, I think a lot of us are kind of stuck in this position because we've got stuff that we can't just go upgrade and apply software to all the time. I can see this on a very small scale. I can see it on a large scale. So a couple of things will help. You, you got to get ahead of things, Um you know, certainly DevOps and the way that Netflix and other organizations operate is a shining example of mm -hmm. always being ahead of this threat. Like we're always just upgrading and moving to the next level and fixing things, breaking things and fixing things. And moving Let me ask a question level. about Netflix based on what you know. I, I love them as an example. I, I think they're doing great stuff. But but you bring up a point. You know, we, we look at a lot of our systems today and when we, all the servers were in-house, we wanted to maximize all the things we could do with them. And mm -hmm. I think most everybody listening to this has run into a situation where you've got a patch, you can't wait to apply it, but we can't reboot the server now. There's no batch windows anymore. And oh, by the way, uh, we didn't really test that, but if you go test it quick, you realize that's going to break something that's mission critical. So yeah, sorry, no patch for you. Mm -hmm. Does Netflix have that problem? Because what we're starting to see with more cloud-oriented companies is they can get very specific, whether they're virtual instances or they're actual boxes, it's got one function. And if you've got one function or a limited set of functions, we can harden that down a lot better. Mm -hmm. I think we can What's upgrade that easier too because I can have two of those systems that do that one function and take one down and upgrade it and put the other one back in. And it's not, of a, big de it's not a big deal, right? Because I don't have uh, this one system that's doing all these functions that I have to worry about. So I, I agree my compartmentalizing. I also think you mentioned cloud. I think that moving services and infrastructure to the cloud eliminates a lot of those vulnerabilities that we deal with today. It yeah. really puts them on someone else, right? But it takes them out of your environment, but it also compartmentalizes them, right? Amazon worries about upgrading the hypervisor. And they're right. doing that behind the scenes because they've got an entire team, a large team of people that that's what they do and that's what they're focused on. As an organization, you can't have that large team internally just for you. And those that can probably do and do a great job of it, and that's fine too. But 
most of us, right, we're going to rely on Amazon to upgrade the hypervisor and do all those things that we don't have to worry about now. So now we're reducing our pool of vulnerabilities and risk that I talked about earlier. Well, yeah, and, and I'll keep this tied to threat intelligence, but w- one of the things that I'm most fascinated with and I'm excited oh, about we're is still that... talking the, about threat intelligence? Sorry. I think we should. Um, <laughs> that the, but the cloud becomes this fantastic forcing function. So now we have organizations that can go focus on very specific things. They have a function. They found a way to market it. And therefore, because they're making money at it, they've got to protect it. Well, it turns out then that that forces either vendors or developers or somebody to come up with solutions, and those solutions then work their way back into our our on-premise equipment. Which you know, and what I liked about you bringing up the Netflix example was, it feels to me like if we always try to stay in front of every potential vulnerability that comes up in one of our scans or in in our management program, um, it it feels to me to be a little bit defeatist. And so part of what I was wondering then, too, is that how frequently would you recalibrate your look? I mean, look, I I know you and I have even talked about this um, both uh, on the program and off. I mean, what's a reasonable cycle these days for patch management, Paul? And then at what point would you say, you know, was it quarterly? I should recalibrate and stuff that falls off the list, let it go. Something that pumped up higher, go focus on that. What's our cycle on this? Because it it can't be perpetual. It's got to be a little... What's the smart cycle here? I well, I think the cycle needs to be much shorter than it is now. Certainly, okay, I don't so know what the cycle. Faster. Is. It has to be a lot faster. I think that we need to uh, embrace new technology that lets us keep up. So, well, in fact, isn't that one of the things you and I talked about before? We how did. many people can actually measure their cycle right now? How how long from awareness of a problem, right? Awareness through figuring out what to do about it and acting on it. Um, I think you and I maybe came around to if, if people were at 45 days, we think they'd be ahead of the curve. I mean, and I'm betting there's people right now telling us they're yelling, oh, I can do it faster. Good for you. Most of you are probably going 45 days. Well, I, I also think we <laughs> I need wish. to separate. I mean, there might be systems and services that have different cycles. And that's that's what really complicates it. It turns it into yep. this like one dimensional thing into like a Rubik's cube, right? Like it has a lot of different sides and a lot of different dimensions. You know, I might be able to update this group of Windows servers with this specific software that, um, okay, maybe I don't even have those servers. Maybe it's in an Azure cloud that I built to host this one application. Oh, I can do really well there, right? I can do really well. Maybe that app isn't as critical uh, to the organization, but I can do really well there. But now I've got this other application. You know, it relies on an AS400 mainframe and has this web application that was written in 1997 And I can't be as agile there. So I think that to say, you know, have one patching strategy for the whole organization, you just, you're not going to get there, unfortunately. Maybe someday. Maybe it is fortunate, actually. Maybe, maybe if we can fear ourselves with some of these concepts. All right. So let's, let's go back. I remembered my third question. I'll lead into it. One of the things that, you know, uh, I've been paying a lot of attention to is what I call this, this bias for prevention, breach prevention bias or whatever you want to call it. It's always that I got to stop everything. It sounds to me, though, like what you're describing in terms of threat intelligence in coordination with your vulnerability management program is pretty awesome on that detection side of things. Like if, if, for example, if I can't fix it as fast as I'd like, once I'm aware of it, I can start looking for it. Am I reading that right? Yeah, I also think it plays in the prevention phase, too, right? No it, argument on that. Yeah. But, but what I don't want people to think is that I've got to get all the things and my prevention has got to be perfect. What I'm saying to them is look at it broader. Yeah, yeah, prevention, but what you can't prevent either because of the cycle, because of the complexity of your environment, because of the politics, whatever it is, at least you can start to know what to look for. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's prevention and detection. It's both. Yeah. I I like to promote the prevention, obviously, because it's a better phase to do security in, right? But... um, in terms of prevention, I really think that if I had to get my crystal ball out and look into October 21st, 2015, oh, wait, that's all in the past now, right? Back to the future. Well, Mets. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, what, what I like to uh, hope that we get to someday is I take threat intelligence, I put that into my vulnerability management system, and it says, hey, you've got you know this, this, and this wrong that, oh, by the way, is an active threat that's happening on the internet today. 
and go in and say, okay, go remediate those vulnerabilities. And it, it's just a, a cycle. It's a process. And that's oh, it's yeah. all I mean, like by the way, one process. Think, think about the power of that. You, you go into whatever your dashboard or reporting mechanism is, and it suggests this is active. It's active against systems like you have in your industry. And based on this report, you are potentially vulnerable to it. Right. And you know you've either passed it or not. Yeah, that, that that's yeah. absolutely and, where I, I mean, And there's technology party. today that can tell me, yeah, these are the systems that are vulnerable to this based on their configuration, their patching level, whatever the case may be. You know, do you want me to just go ahead and fix that? But yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think so the they, fixing part, the fixing part, we still need some work on. And a lot of that is trust. I don't think there's a big demand for it in the market because people don't trust it to go automatically fix it. We've been burned on that enough that we're we're still skeptical and, and, yeah. and we'll get but there. I think that, but that's also me, that's where specific, right? When you talk about the compartmentalization and segmentation, that's where we'll get better at that mm -hmm. because there's there's less stuff to break. Like we've always joked for years, you want to figure out who owns it, pull the plug on it. But yeah, that's also a way to shorten your career path. Mm -hmm. So what I what I love about what you're sharing with this and, and looking at it is is how you can start to get actionable intelligence out of it. And the key, though, is, is don't neglect that part of, but which of the systems hold critical data? I, I've been with teams that come back and they go, this is high vulnerability and it's being exploited and we have it here. And, and I always have two questions for them. Is it one of your top five systems in your organization? Or, right, or part of that is, is it a pathway to it? And what's the level of effort to get to that system? Like, can someone actually exploit it and if they did, then what damage could they do with it? And I find most teams can't answer either of those questions. And that's that's where I think we can do better as an industry. Oh, and that's a great point about threat intelligence, Mike. When people ask me how to prioritize threat intelligence coming, and they're like, you know, a lot of it is, is cruft. And a lot of it, I think, is they don't real they may not realize it's not applicable to them because they have other protections in place. So there could be a critical vulnerability or some something happening on the internet that people are using to compromise systems. And you may have that same technology, but you've got something else that makes that attack virtually impossible. So therefore, on your risk scale, that's much lower. Being able to define those things, I think, is really, really powerful. You know, in a lot of the vulnerability management systems, you can change the, the criticality of a rating, and a lot of that plays into your own environment. But I think in industry as a, as a whole, we as an industry don't do a good enough job of defining um, where some of our protection mechanisms are in place. Uh, to well, I think it's to, because to, we define risk. I mean, I've been looking at this a lot lately, and, and what I've started to realize is a lot of it we've done just dogmatically. The 20 years I've been here, we're doing some of the same things. If you go into an organization and say, what's the value that you're getting from that? I don't know. Well, are, are you measuring it? No. No, but we have a firewall. Right. Okay. But, but I was told I have to have these things, and so I have them. Mm. Okay, how much is it costing you to maintain that license and to man that console or do whatever with it? I don't know. It didn't add it up. So what we're finding is that we have a whole bunch of stuff in place and we're not really certain if it's incre increasing our protection or not. We're, we're rightfully scared to take it out because, you know, what if we're wrong? Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, where I think we've got a real opportunity is look, how do we start measuring that stuff and looking at what's actually important? Because then, as you've suggested, I mean, gosh, if, if I knew that my, that my preventions and my protections were in place and I had a sense of how they worked and what kinds of things they could do, uh, you would it would make so much of what we're talking about easier and more effective. And the thing is, it can be done. It just it requires stopping a little bit and and thinking it through. But let me ask this other question too, because when I see threat intelligence, and I look at how these machines and these systems, and all our platforms are supposed to interact, are there standards that you're seeing then that are coming out? Because every time I go to a talk on these, I, I hear you know I like taxi, I don't like taxi, I like stick, I don't like stick, I like this, I don't like that. We need a new one. Where are we at in terms of interoperability? We are we heading in the right direction? Um, no, I think in general, most of the tools and technology we've discussed, Mike, don't really uh, have a whole lot on the interoperability front, in my opinion. At least that's what I've seen, and a lot of my job. Lately, what I'm seeing too. Yeah, and a lot of my job lately has been evaluating technology along those lines. So, yeah. Well, so part of it somber, too. Well, no, it's not, but it's not somber. I mean, like it's you know, this is where right, it's an opportunity. <laughs> well, I mean, this is where I focus a lot on the leadership of it. it you know, are, are you trying to create a, a market for yourself by 
uh, saying, I can solve this problem. And oh, by the way, we're going to call it something different. And, and then we're going to lock people into it. Or are you going to say, here's how we get better. And, and let me help everybody get better. Right. And, and one is a scarcity mindset. One's an abundance mindset. Naturally in security, we tend to practice the scarcity mindset. But what happens as we start saying, no, hold on. If it, let's go back to it. If you are evaluating these tools with a vendor, ask them, what's the problem that you solve? Ask, what, what's the problem that you think I need to solve? How does your solution help me? How tall do I need to be to ride this ride? Go back to your question about if I'm overwhelmed. Say, look, you know, l- sign the NDA. Let them into your environment. How does your solution help me? Mm-hmm. Because if it's going to just increase your time, right, push it back on value. Is this going to increase my capabilities? Is it going to reduce my risk? What is it, what is it going to do for me exactly? And how do I quantify that? By the way, for the vendors that can do that, it should be easy sell. It's X number of dollars, you'll get five times X value in the first year. By the way, if you can get five times value on a return in year one, it's a, that's a no-brainer. Now, figuring that out, yeah, right, that's where we got some work to do. But, that's, but if we don't start asking these questions routinely and of ourselves... I don't, I don't know how we get better. So it's not about being somber that we haven't figured out interoperability. It's the same thing. Why do we have seven frameworks for risk assessment where they're 90% alike? Why do we have eight different ways of sharing information? Because we're, we're not slowing down long enough to say, hey, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And, and what's that common ground that we have that where we can all still be different, add something unique to it, make a living at it, and, and benefit the people around us? And that's where our opportunity comes in. That's, that's where we get those opportunities. I, I, I think... I think we'll get there. I, I'm optimistic about it some days. Today, I'm optimistic about it. Next week could be a totally different story, Mike. Next week might be a different story. Uh, so with that, we're going to take a short break. Um, we're going to come back and talk about our stories of the week. We've got a lot of great stories to talk about this week, Mike. Uh, a lot happening in the news, so stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 